Welcome everyone to Decrypted Unscripted. My name is Dominique Shelton Leipzig. This is the opportunity that my partner David Bitterman and I have to really unpack what's going on in privacy and data security and data in general. We talk about privacy, data, information in general. We cover everything from national security to mom and pops getting ransomware attacks. It's just great to spend some time with Dominique talking about these issues. Data is everything. If a company is not digital and they are not not using technology and data. They're really not a company in today's world. Thank you all for listening. Welcome to Decrypted Unscripted. This is a podcast with Dominique Shelton Leipzig and me, David Bitterman, where we look at privacy, data, and social justice, frankly. We want to look at social justice and we try to relate it to that as close as we can. And uh, but, but we're very interested in that. And in that connection, we're extremely fortunate to have Daniela Balu Aris. Am I pronounced that correct, Daniela? That's great. <laughs> Pretty close. Who is was the founder and is currently the head of a project called Leadership Now, which is basically, it's a group of professionals who are also in business, businesses who are pursuing some key principles. I think most relevant now are voting rights, but there's a a variety of principles that are listed that science matters, that that the economy must work for all, and diversity is an asset. So with that all being said, Danielle, thanks. Thanks for coming. I know you, you really are, sounds like what you're doing is amazing. And I wanted to share, have you share that with our listeners. And what we usually do, and what I'm going to do here, is just just tell us about yourself. You know, literally, you can tell us what street you grew up on. That's, that's we go that deep. So, you know, what'd you grow up on? What'd you, how'd you, where'd you do? How you got to this particular place in your life? Because that's, it's, it's cool. Everybody's life is cool, right? So there's funny things in everyone's life. So, yeah, so. well, I, I'm happy to have been here and it's it's a pleasure to be here and have this conversation. And I actually really love data <laughs> and uh, have tried in, in throughout my, my career to, to deploy different ways of looking at problems and data in unexpected places. So I'm looking forward to touching on that. I'm a New Yorker. I grew up in New York. I grew up mostly in Brooklyn. I went to New York City Public Schools. And I always did like math. <laughs> wow. so I, 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 I I'm not to- trying to age you, but you must have grown up in Brooklyn before Brooklyn was like hip and cool. It was, yes. It, and it was even a neighborhood that's still not that hip and cool, even now. <laughs> <laughs> Just to give you a flavor. Uh, well, what uh, what's the neighborhood called though? If I if you put it on this podcast, people start to move there. But yeah, anyway, uh, Bay Ridge. Uh, okay, so, cool. Yeah, so part of the time there, I find I moved around a bit. I also lived in Chelsea for time, but yeah, it, it, New York was a different place then. I'm thinking of New York these days because I just moved back from I spent my family and I spent the last nine years in Washington D.C. and I find that I kind of appreciate both places for different reasons and I have complaints about the places for different reasons. <laughs> but uh, look, I've been really fortunate that in my career, I've been kind of moved between different spheres. When we were talking before the podcast started, I studied engineering and Cornell operations research. At what that would be called today is data science. I wasn't kind of calling it that yet, but, and I went on to you know, work in strategy consulting, but it was able to do that around the world in South Africa, in London, and really became interested in the questions of how to, you know, I saw all of this innovation happening on the analysis side, on the way companies were addressing problems in their supply chains or in their, and I, my big question was, we, we're solving all these issues of inequality at that time, the HIV crisis, as when I was living in South Africa, was just starting in the late 90s. And I really wondered, why can't we deploy the kind of analysis and assets and, and strategies that you see in the private sector to solve some of these bigger social challenges? And so my career has been a mix of doing that in different contexts, starting a firm and now the largest, one of the largest global social impact strategy firms called Dahlberg, serving in the Obama administration under 
two secretaries of state and now starting Leadership Now Project and trying to bring that those pieces together, the policy side, how do we, you know, what is it that we need to do in the world um, to solve problems? And then how do we take data and new business models to uh, solve that? Yeah, tell us a little bit about Dahlberg, um, if, you, if you don't mind. That was a, I, I know it was important in the Obama administration. And tell us how you came to, to found it and what its goals were and what you did. Dahlberg, uh, I joined when we were, you know, seven people sitting in Barnard office space in 2002. And really with just the idea that we could bring, many of us came out of, of strategy firms I've been at Bain, others at McKinsey, and we really wanted, but we wanted to work on the kind of bigger issues of the day, whether it was climate change, global health, et cetera. And so we worked with anyone from the UN to a foundation to nonprofits on solving those problems. I focused on the HIV crisis, on how we could get drug price reductions, better distribution at a state and a country level in Africa, building institutions around responding to the crisis. And that was about nine years of kind of building the organization and the team, building offices across Africa and Asia, Latin America. And that led me to, uh, we didn't do much work with governments uh, at all, but we were asked to take a fresh look at some of the U.S. government assistance and how things could be done differently. And after that, I was asked to join the administration as an advisor uh, to Secretary of State at that time, Clinton, and later Kerry around how do you, you know, move from a more traditional foreign assistance orientation to one that looks at emerging markets and countries that are moving, you know, up the development spectrum you know, really treats them as partners and looks at the full range of investment that the U.S. can do, whether that's on the business side, whether that's as um, the philanthropic or foreign assistance side. Uh, so I spent a lot of time negotiating the sustainable development goals, which were a really interesting kind of data-driven way of looking about what is the world trying to achieve by the year 2030. And tell us how business, private sector, businesses who's ultimate goal is to make money, right? How they get involved and why they get involved in those kinds of efforts. I think about two different elements of the role of business and business people in solving problems. And that applies to the work I'm doing now focused on American democracy. One piece of the picture is as an individual who has built a certain set of skills and We've seen a huge amount of innovation in the last 20, 30 years around data analytics, around business models. I think there is a lot of learnings from that that can be applied to social problems. So there's a talent and new way of thinking piece to having business people or those with a business and training be part of the solution. And frankly, for people to go cross sectors, you know, to go to work in government, to work in policy, et cetera. So I don't think that's only business people. I think there's the exchange of skills with whether it's policy, law, engineering. We need a mix of skills rather than silos because the problems we solve are too great. So my piece of the picture is that I understand and I have built, I feel like, amazing networks over the years of people with a business background who want to contribute to change of the world and want to work with others in doing that um, of all different backgrounds. The second piece is businesses themselves, right? What What is the role that they play in society? How can they impact those problems? And I see that as twofold. There's one which is a do no harm piece, right? Businesses are actors. Uh, they can do good things or bad things in the world, depending on their business model and how they interact with systems. And so when we look at, for instance, U.S. politics, the question is, I mean, the largest lobby organizations in the country are the Chamber of Commerce and the Business Roundtable. They're impacting the political system. We can argue sometimes for good or bad. So we want companies to think about the role that already they're playing in the political system and make sure that's supporting democracy. And then also think about the positive proactive role. You know, Make sure your current business is doing the right things for democracy. And then as you think about new ways to contribute, how can you, for instance, make it much more accessible for your employees and customers to vote, right? That's the innovation side. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit first about the skill side and the transfer of skills. Would you give me an example of sort of, a, you know, systems or, or, or a concrete example of, of the skills transfer 
and how it was sort of operationalized on the policy side. Sure, yeah. I, I mean, I think there's a lot of spaces where that's possible. So let's take, for instance, in... I'll take the HIV crisis for a minute, and then I'll talk, take an example in the U.S. democracy context, right? So when the HIV crisis was really at a rapid growth rate in Africa, there was this recognition by academics, by advocates, that the prices of HIV drugs were just not untenable. You know, you had, it cost $10,000 a year. You were having millions of people in Africa who were getting the virus, and it was just not going to be possible for people to be treated. And so there was a very significant advocacy movement to push and seek reductions in drug prices, to seek differential treatment of patents in different regions. And that was that was important. That that did push. But what you needed as well was the ability to both work with different pharma companies to say, okay, what's the business model here? You know, so you had the advocacy, but then how are we going to do the distribution? How are we, how, once the prices were lower, what was the actual distribution structures, the cost, the funding needed, the entire kind of business model for building a new distribution infrastructure in Africa? And for that, you were going to need business skills and analytical skills plus policy skills to do it. And so we saw that kind of all come together. It was, you know, it took more time than everyone would have wanted. It wasn't always perfect. There were actors who weren't happy and who were, but in the end, I will say, and this is a program that I had oversight of when I was in the U.S. government, that the, the U.S. government's HIV program, which ultimately President Bush signed and, and, and is ongoing, and to, you know, billions of dollars each year has treated millions of people in Africa with HIV treatments. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, you don't hear. You know, maybe it's me, but you don't hear nearly as much about um, HIV as in the past. So I'm assuming because treatment is accessible. Um, and there was a lot of people who said it couldn't be done. They were like, "Oh, can we really get treatment to Africa? Are people going to take it, etc.?" And adherence rates in Africa were just as high, if not higher, than anywhere else. I mean, so. I think it was uh, that was an example where you saw those pieces together. When we look at the current in the current context in the U.S. and the current state of American democracy, where there's a lot of frustration and uh, a feeling that the system is really not uh, serving citizens or responsive to citizens, I think there are you know numerous ways. We saw, for instance, Snapchat recently did a voter registration drive. And I mean, in a month, they had more people register than, you know, traditional efforts. I, I don't have the data in front of me, but the traditional efforts had in years, right? They, you know, once it was communicated through that platform and they partnered with NGOs, you know, that they weren't doing the drive directly themselves. They were providing a platform to organizations who were supporting uh, people who not only wanted to register, but run for office, et cetera. And so we have just such an ability to use new platforms to get people engaged in the system, not to mention, and all of these things can be for good or for bad. Of course, we know that there's, you know, right now we're facing very significant disinformation that is going through data platforms as various kinds, social media platforms. And so at the same time, the ability to turn that around is also going to come from innovations in data and social media, et cetera. You know, all of these, all of the technology, communication technology that we have now exists. <laughs> it's not, it's not going to, it's not going to go away. And of course, there's, there is regulation and other things you can do to, to provide some guardrails, but you will also are going to need the innovation. I was talking with someone the other day who's working on anti-authoritarian tech. You know, said that was a very <laughs> a good term, and you're going to need the technology innovation uh, to respond to what's very serious threats of disinformation uh, in the ecosystem right now. So I feel like there's this need to invite all skill sets into renewing our democracy and politics. Ironically feels very exclusionary <laughs> to many, even those who would, it only asks you, you to vote or write a check, depending who you are and not much else, as opposed to 
really bring all of your skills and all of your assets and networks to uh, being part of the solution. And I think that's what we need. That brings us to sort of the second prong you identified is why businesses would be involved and which was their goals and you know, the do no harm. And and just curious about why do businesses get involved in, say, voter registration? I can see why, why some platforms wouldn't want disinformation, obviously. But what prompts businesses to get involved in things that are really sort of adjacent to what their ultimate goal is? It, it, would be the way to say it. Yeah, so I'd like to redefine the problem a little bit because I actually think this is core uh, to business and how we think about it first is risks. So right now, we as a nation have pretty well described election risks that we're facing, risks to the legitimacy of future elections, risks to the economy that come from that disruption, and risks to our system of government, which are, unfortunately, we know what it looks like when you have sliding of democratic norms and the ability for leaders to abuse the system. And so our entry point for this problem and what we discuss with companies and what our members are very concerned about, our members, by the way, are individuals, they're not companies, they're individual business leaders, is we need to really have a very broad coalition who is working to ensure that our elections are legitimate. It's really concerning that a third of Americans don't trust the results of the last election. That creates a lot of discord and risk of even instability and violence. So we think that's a core risk issue for companies. It's not a side issue that's discretionary to understand, to know about. We see ESG investors are increasingly concerned about it. We hear about it from the international from international investors, from international companies all the time are raising it with American businesses. So I think that's one piece. I think the second side is issues like voting and participation. Companies are certainly hearing from employees and from their customers that this is important to them. It's in a company's interest, I think, to make sure that their employees and communities and customers can participate in the system, can have faith in the system, So I think that's another area where, of course, different companies that have different capabilities to bring to the table on that, you know, some, you know, if you're a small company, you know, helping your your employees be informed on when they can vote and where and all those things is useful. If you're a big company that has big reach, I mentioned Snapchat earlier, then there's a whole set of other things you can do. And there's, you know, 1,200 companies now that have joined something called the Civic Alliance, which basically gives companies a playbook to inform their employees and customers about voting. And that's many branded companies that are doing that as well. So yeah, I think some of this is not discretionary and and some of it is. Wow, okay. That's the first time, I'm not kidding you, the first time that, that someone has articulated for me the reason why companies ought to be involved in these efforts. It's risk, it is risk. And and that's really, a, that's, a, that's a great, great way to think about it. And, and it's funny you should say that international companies are particularly concerned. Is that is that true? I mean, uh, well, I would say U.S. companies when they're interacting internationally, it's getting raised with them. It's getting raised by international investors. It's getting raised by com- companies and business leaders in other countries that are their partners, right? So they're saying, "What's going on in the U.S.? It seems risky now." You, you know. It, it, we used to know that the U.S. was a reliable democracy, and now it seems like there's a, a lot of discord and, and problems and people don't even trust in elections. I mean, that is, you know, people are watching, right? The world watches the U.S. for good or for bad, and they're concerned. I mean, other democracies are concerned about what they're seeing. And we've slid in the, you know, if you look at international indices of democracy, um, like the EIU and Freedom House and others, I mean, we're sliding in all of them. We're, we're, go, we're moving down from a full democracy to a flawed democracy. So, and, and you look at academics, you know, the number of kind of whether it's how democracies die and like this um, Seablatt, Tim Snyder out of Yale. I mean, there's many that are looking at basically what does the data tell you about warning signs for a democracy, warning signs that there could be failure in the system and unfortunately, we have many of them. There's this, you know, lack of a shared fact base. There's erosion of the polling says, especially millennials and Gen Z have very little faith in our system and institutions. 
you know, we have extremes on both sides. So there's there's a lot of risk factors uh, right now. You know, the positive story is that if you look at history, where business stands on democracy can have a very significant influence on outcomes. So in South Africa, during a apartheid, ultimately business stood on the side of moving to a multiracial democracy. So I would say they were always there in the street, but they were really important in pushing the apartheid government, as was the financial communities as they had sanctions and others were started to cut off um, their ability to access capital. So and business was really a part of kind of the reforming of the nation that came next. You know, the flip side is, I think you would hear, we've heard from business leaders in Turkey that they waited far too long to say that the country was going in the wrong direction. There's, you know, a lot of concern in business leaders in Brazil right now about backsliding there. And, you know, if you look at World War II and Nazi Germany, business did not stay on the side of democracy fully. And we obviously know where that went. So I think if we acknowledge that business is, is collectively powerful politically and are both because of their presence in Washington and lobbying, but also because they're being employers and influencers, it, that it's, I, th- I think the challenge is business often wants to be neutral, right? They want to be neutral. They don't want to be seen as partisan, et cetera. And I think our argument is that democracy is shouldn't be partisan. <laughs> standing on the side of democracy, frankly, standing on the side of voting rights, that shouldn't be partisan. And if it's being made partisan, if stances that support, for instance, ensuring election administrators aren't threatened in their state, if that's being made partisan, you can't accept that position. We just had, you know, our, our we have a group of members in Wisconsin who are leading an effort in that state, a group of Wisconsin businesses leaders for democracy, who just wrote letters to every election administrator in the state, thanking them for their service, saying that business is supportive of nonpartisan election administration and their ability to do that without being feeling at risk at a personal level. Our members and our networks have been routinely, since the 2020 election, coming out publicly in support of the legitimacy of the election, the importance of acknowledging the results, and the importance of making sure the core of our system is functional. And I don't think anyone should, I don't want to see any business leaders or companies who feel scared to do that. And unfortunately, we see that some political leaders actually really try to push back on companies standing out and on these issues, which I think is really problematic. Oh, that's really interesting. I mean, it's, it's, uh, well, I'm just curious. Can you just give me an example of the pushback. I mean, you know, because I remember when people, when we, they, what they move the World Series. I mean, you just tell me about what happens when something happens like that. Well, there's a couple of different kinds of pushback, but I mean, you know, when you saw it in, in Georgia, when companies stepped out like Delta and the legislature starts to threaten unfavorable tax policy or regulation. We've seen that in Texas as well, as companies stood, stepped out that, you know, the legislature was willing to say, if you're pushing back on this and these issues, you're going to feel it. <laughs> you know, look, I think that kind of willingness of political leaders to suggest retribution for businesses for exercising their free speech, I would suggest, is really worrying and is another indicator of an unhealthy democracy. Uh, oh, yeah. Interesting. You know, I just had to correct myself. I, it was not the World Series that was moved. It was the All-Star game that was moved, right? Uh, and that's where, yeah. that's where they took some heat. And a couple other things just related to that. Have you seen those, Ray Dalio, have you seen the books that he's been writing and how he's sort of predicting this, like, a very ominous crisis and split? I mean, is that mainstream or is that how do you view that i just curious because it, it he, he's obviously in business big time you know that's his job is to invest money but he's got these observations and historical correlations and and he goes to i mean enormous efforts to look at these things and his outlook is not good so i'm just curious what what, what are your thoughts about that part of what we're dealing with is the confluence of a dramatically changing economy a set of institutions that are were innovative when they were formed, but no longer are. And a set of 
citizens who are rightfully frustrated that in a dramatically changing world where there's a whole set of people who are struggling to adjust to that, don't have institutions that can do anything for them. So our best hope is that we come out of this with the innovation and renewal. You know, we, I, I'd like to think we're already far enough, close enough to crisis that we should be working to really dramatically change the way that we're doing things so that we come out of this, you know, on the other side. And and in that connection, are you thinking principally of voting rights or are you thinking about other things also? Oh, certainly other things. I mean, I think the question is, I like to be careful not to equate democracy and voting rights. Voting rights is an element of democracy. But I mean, a functional democracy is the result of a whole set of institutions where we, the people, are able to choose our leaders. And those leaders address a responsive to you our needs and demands. And behind that sits a whole set of institutions in Washington that, that should be designed to respond to the needs of, of the public. There's a whole set of institutions in every state and then local councils. And, you know, so you can't change everything at once. But, you know, I think our thesis is you need to work in tandem with improving the rules of the game addressing things like voting rights and gerrymandering and the structure of campaign finance with supporting the leaders who are willing to drive that transformation. We don't have time, from my opinion, to wait for all, a whole set of structural fixes to change the incentives, to get new people in, you know, like there, there's like a lot, but we need to do them in tandem, right? And who are the kinds of leaders that are going to kind of see us out of this have that multifaceted set of experiences and perspectives everywhere from your local town council to Congress to the presidency, we're going to need a drive towards more innovation. And then at the same time, you know, make sure the core of the system, voting rights, you know, the side of districts is like not creating all the right, wrong incentives for who participates. That's interesting. You tie it to innovation and it really is. So I'm going to Jump ahead a little bit. Well, first, I'm going to jump back. So you, you were talking about businesses partnering with government to take care of the HIV problem. Our prior president, needless to say, president, was controversial. Project Warp Speed, Do you th- was that a good example of that kind of combination, notwithstanding that it was basically undertaken under with a president who doesn't otherwise stand for those kinds of partnerships and things? Look, I haven't looked in detail at the structure of the partnership. We obviously got vaccines quickly, right? So from an outcome perspective, I don't know if you can attribute it exclusively to that, the design and setup of Project Warp Speed, but we certainly did get, you know, produce vaccines that are now, you know, saving all of our lives. So I think that ultimately, you need a business in that partnership, obviously, to get us to a place where you could get vaccines quickly. So perhaps it was the design of that. It, perhaps it was the design of that partnership. I, I can't say for sure. But I do think there is always a tension between different sectors of society, between business and government, you know, between labor, like all of those things exist and need to be worked through over time. I don't think that should prevent us from re- recognizing that this country has crazy assets. Like, <laughs> we have extraordinary <laughs> assets, right? We have extraordinary capabilities. We have extraordinary ability to solve problems and innovate and bring different types of ideas and actors to the table. And it's like, we're not using that, right? We're not using that to solve the problem of our democracy right now. We're not using that in climate change. You see some of that right? Where you do see this, I mean, you see quite a bit of it, actually. There's a lot of innovation happening happening on the technology side. You see businesses acting, you know, sometimes in really good ways. Other times they're being unhelpful and lobbying in Washington against good climate uh, legislation, which I wrote about in our business review recently. (laughs) You know, but this is the duality of where we are, right? Like we need that innovation. We need that forward leading. We can't do it without all those capabilities that sit within the private sector in the U.S. But you also also need to recognize where those that influence is being deployed unhelpfully and work to solve those problems together. And you say a lot of that innovation is in the private sector that needs to be, is that a fair statement that, that needs to be? Yeah, I mean, 
there's definitely innovation that happens in the public sector or in nonprofits. I've been in all of those realms. It's not that there's no innovation there, but the reality is most people work in companies of some sort, <laughs> small or large. I mean, just like the bulk of, <laughs> of, of people and the bulk of analytics, innovation, new business models, all of those things has happened in spades over the last 30 years in, in companies. And so if we can either be concerned that not all of that innovation has been good, which is certainly true, and so not use it, <laughs> not use that, or you can say, look, these are a whole set of capabilities that should be deployed. Like I was always struck by graduating as an engineer. I had so many job opportunities coming out of college that were interested in using those analytical skills to solve problems, et cetera. But in the political space, no one would have known what to do with that because the skills that were valued would be like writing the memo. Nothing wrong with writing a good memo. Learned over time how to write good memos. But the power of all those other skills were deeply underutilized. So you see them used more in government now for sure as well. But I don't think you can just kind of, for sure, they don't sit sufficiently within our public institutions to alone solve those problems. Yeah. Okay. And then let's talk about Leadership Now Project. I mean, that, just tell us the whole story, why you decided to do it. And, and so I've looked at the members and, and it's amazing, but I'll let you talk. Well, Leadership Now Project is a membership organization of business and thought leaders committed to renewing American democracy. Our members are across the country and our organization has chapters in multiple cities. We're in seven cities now with chapters, but also a member base. We have members in more than 20 states. And the main focus of the organization is to make sure we have a well-informed, activated group of business professionals who are ready to stand up for democracy and innovate for it to service through you know, the next 200 years of your, our country, right? And that's like, those are heady goals in a certain way, right? And and I spoke earlier about how when you look historically, business being on the side of democracy is really important when democracy is threatened. So that definitely is some of the genesis. But then the reality of the organization is practically, as we bring a group of people together, we analyze this problem together. We work with academics to understand what's really going on at a national level, a state level, where are the biggest problems, and then who can we work with, either by partnering with an organization, investing in an organization, working with political leaders to solve that problem. So that could mean advocating for federal legislation on voting and elections. It could mean supporting voter participation in a, a particular state, or it could mean our members being visible in the business press on what election risk is and what it means and why that's a core systemic risk to your business. And I'll just ask, how did you recruit your members? I mean, the key members that, that are those that appear on the website. How, how, how did you recruit so them? So the, the origin of the organization is I joined uh, in 2017 with a group of other Harvard Business School classmates who were concerned with the state affairs. I had been you know, building a, a company and then in government. So I had been close to what was happening in, in Washington. But what I found was many of my peers, some who've been politically involved, some who weren't, were very concerned with the state of the affairs. And that wasn't only Trump being president, but it was recognizing that we had a system that wasn't working. And so our goal was to engage in the system in a way that was smarter. <laughs> we wanted to understand what, what was the core problem we were facing in our democracy, not just show up and write a check to a candidate or show up at the Women's March, <laughs> where we where many of us met together to plan this out. And we quickly, we took some time to go. We went back, we, in the beginning, we worked with Harvard academics, particularly now we worked with academics across the country. But we really went to those who'd been studying the state of our democracy for a long time, whether it was Larry Lessig or uh, recently Michael Porter had done work on this at the business school, David Gergen, others. And we really said, what is your assessment? You know, where are the problems? What are the core underpinnings of this? And we started to build a group of members from our networks who were worried about the same things. And that turned out not to only be Democrats, for instance, <laughs> It, it turned out to not only be people in one part of the country. And so 
we came down quite early in 2018 that voting, redistricting, campaign finance, and new talent and politics were kind of the themes. And we set off since then to both educate our members and our networks as they've grown, provide real opportunities to invest time and money against those problems. And then increasingly since 2020, as an organization, we've been a public voice for business, representing kind of a forward-leaning business community who's concerned with the state of democracy. We, We led statements in 2020 around that in the lead up to the election with business leaders like Reid Hoffman and Seth Klarman and others. We've done statements uh, around, we just did a kind of recognition of the anniversary of January 6th. So we kind of have a, a very, a, a constant stream of our members who are making the case for democracy. We've done amicus briefs to the Supreme Court on the importance of voting rights. We're not only the actions of our individual members, although those are critical and can have more impact, you know, could be the most impactful things, but we also are increasingly at the table as a, as a business group that's collectively standing up. And when you say the individuals can have the most effect, I mean, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. So one of our members, for instance, in, in Texas, who's a senior executive at a large company, was really a critical voice on voting rights in the state when the state laws came, and then also was very influential in the industry associations in the state. And so we armed her to be able to be that voice with the data and the analysis, and also had other partners from the voting rights world who really could help navigate what was really going on with the legislation, et cetera. Similarly, in Wisconsin, we see that where the business leaders in that state are now visibly, as I mentioned, supporting election administrators, that's them driving that. You know, we're providing the analysis and the understanding and kind of guidance on what could be done. But then, you know, many of our members are taking that forward. So we do some things directly ourselves, but we do a lot to arm our members to be leaders in their own spheres as well. The leaders that you talked about are your your individual members. When they take those kinds of actions, do they take those in their role as an executive of the company, or do they take those actions as a role of a concerned citizen? A uh, mix. It's a mix. So we've seen a lot of our you know members actively, you know, they're senior executives in their companies. They've actively been part of reviewing corporate PAC contributions, for instance, right? And are able to have that conversation internally about what those contributions me than what the impact on democracy might be. So I think there's a big recognition that civic education in this country is weak. And I think our members have, and myself included, have really seen the need to be well educated <laughs> on the system, on what's happening, um, to have the data, to have the information so that they can be better leaders. And I would argue that any leader of any company in this country should really understand our democracy and really understand how their organization is participating in it. Um, And that's kind of a baseline. Wow. All right. We're going to quote that. Those two sentences are going to be the quote on that. So, uh, (laughs) but yeah, so seriously, two things. One is if you were to rate the state of our democracy on a you know, one through 10 level. Well, how would you, where would you rate it? And then why? I'm assuming 10 is the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, I give it a five. Oh, you're kidding. Wow. That bad, huh? I think five is a space that recognizes the challenges, but isn't hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> but you think... Basically, the principles of democracy are are such in the United States right now that really you sort of say they're 50-50. I mean, is that fair? Well, I, I'm not sure that I, I equate the five to like a 50-50 chance that we turn into autocracy in the next few years. I, what I equate it to is the combination of deliberate efforts to undermine institutions. And I, I think it's not un- inaccurate to say deliberate, not just benign 
lack of attention. So we have a lot of kind of lack of attention. That's a problem, right? So we have this just lack of engagement, institutions just becoming out of date and ineffective, people not even knowing who their representatives are, all of those things. That's very significant. Very few Americans know really who represents them. Can They can maybe name the president. You know, I mean, there's just huge, huge gap in just even knowing the system and how it works. And then what you're seeing right now is a very deliberate effort to write laws that allow for part partisan interference in elections and to create list mistests tests in elections that suggest that only those who are willing to say our elections are illegitimate are going to gain support in their primaries, for instance. So I, I think those are big warning signs that are kind of deliberate undermining of democracy. And then I think there's also a fairly pronounced just lack of faith in the system. So there's the disengagement. But when you look at the data, I mean, in the 60s, I think 60 or 70 percent of Americans trusted government most of all the time. And that's going down to 25 oh, percent. Right? So on. you have this, right? just, these trust in government numbers, pew tracks, I mean, are, are really dramatic. But what's even more worrying is when you dig into millennials and Gen Z, there's a real detachment from the system, a lack of sense of this, that democracy is a system that matters or that serves them, et cetera. Not necessarily an alternative, but th that data is really worrying about just faith in the underpinnings of the system. And some of that is lack of civic education and awareness, et cetera. And some of it is seeing a lack of results. So we have like a big, I give it a five because we have a massive kind of collective consciousness problem, and we also have a structural problem. But all that said, I think if you can kind of harness the assets, like I said, the assets of this country, you can you can solve that. But you have to give a sense of hope. Like there's a lot of lack of hope right now in the polling that suggests people feel like, you know, things aren't going well and we don't, you know, not only democracy, but in the inequality in the economy and, and all of those things. So we have a big, we have to turn a big corner in terms of a sense that we can solve problems together again, but I'm not without hope. I, I see a level of energy and activity in this space that certainly I didn't see when we started. And in 2017, there was just a lot of people worrying about the election and those kinds of things. But now I see a formation of activities towards solutions that is encouraging and we just have to move quickly. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. That's well, that's good news. That's good news. So in that regard, I'm just and the business involvement, when you mentioned the civic alliance, which is businesses aligned, and maybe you could describe that and how it interacts with what you do. That's what question number one. And then question number two is, you know, that letter that Ken Frazier wrote about fair elections, what have been the consequences of that? Has that had an impact? And, and are these individual executives concerned about these things and doing things about these things? So the first on Civic Alliance, what Civic Alliance has done is provided a set of tools to companies to help them offer time off for voting, support civic engagement. So they, they offer basically a toolkit and they help companies both internally and externally demonstrate their commitment to that. So they play a very different role than we play, but a very complementary one, right? Which is what's the toolkit that your company needs to engage in voting time off, poll time off for poll working, those types of things. On the second question about Ken Chanel and Ken Frazier's letter. Former CEO of American Express and former CEO of Pfizer, right? Is that, sorry. Exactly. Yeah. At that time, current, but now former CEO of Pfizer, Ken Frazier. So they led an effort after seeing what was happening in Georgia on voting rights, they led an effort to have CEOs of, across the country of the biggest companies sign on to make clear that voting rights was something that they supported and was the interest of American business. We were part of hosting a, a group of CEOs last April when it, where Ken Shaw and Ken Fraser launched that letter. 
And we saw, I mean, it was, it was actually a meeting we pulled together with the Yale School of Management and in a very short order, we and, and Jeff Sonnenfeld and others who were involved in organizing were able to pull together CEOs onto this Zoom call because they were really concerned about what was happening in Georgia and, and, and Ken Chanel and Ken Frazier were part of that group and were starting to galvanize or had already galvanized CEOs and, and subsequently put out uh, this letter that showed that commitment. And I think what that showed was, you know, CEOs were concerned that democracy could be threatened. They were concerned about voting rights because it was a basic right and, and core pillar and important for their employees and their communities. What happened subsequently was there was a lot of pushback around <laughs> around companies and CEOs participating in suggestion that this was either a not a real issue or that these were woke CEOs go playing in a lane that wasn't appropriate. And this has continued, right? This kind of, frankly, lack of clarity around the issue and what we see, there's a lot of suggestion that voting rights isn't really an issue or that, you know, the, the concerns were misplaced or that this is not the place for CEOs uh, to weigh in. And I think what our counter to that has been and the executives that we work with is what I talked about earlier, which is these were not just isolated bills. They were part of an effort to pass a suite of legislation across states across the country that restricted voting, allowed for partisan interference in elections, and reinforced a narrative that the 2020 election was stolen. So any particular bill may or may not be extremely restrictive. And part of the reason why some of the bills that, uh, like in Georgia and Texas were restrictive, but not as bad as they could have been, is there was very intensive negotiations, including weighing in by business to make them less bad, right? So, and the intention would have been to make them worse. But the reason, the overarching reason that these bills have been pursued is to reinforce the electorate who believes the election was stolen, that there was a response needed to an unfair election. And that's what's almost most damaging about the whole thing is that all of these laws are just reinforcing risk and are creating a system that people don't have to live in. And for that, we see a lot of concern from the business community, the, the idea that Americans are no longer going to believe in elections creates the risk of, uh, of violence, uncertainty, you know, huge, it could, that could hugely impact their businesses and the markets and their lives. That's why it's in the shareholders' interest for those CEOs to take those positions. Is that fair? Is that what you're, you're... Certainly, that's what we'd argue that, you know, look, None of us are great at handling risk. I mean, you're a lawyer, so you're probably better than I am no. as a <laughs> business. <laughs> but, you know, we're often, every financial crisis will tell us that we're not good at <laughs> predicting future risk. There would be a small group of people are typically, but generally are not good at predicting risk. And what I would argue is we have the opportunity now to reduce and mitigate future risks. There are things we can do now that will make it less likely that we have an election crisis, a legitimate pre crisis, violence, market crashes, et cetera. I hope that in 2024, everyone says, oh, you guys were overestimating the risk because that means <laughs> it, we prevented it, right? Yeah, right? So, you know, look, I don't, I, I really don't like to be alarmist in any ways. And I think I've always, as we've been doing this analysis and seeing the risk factors, I think we've always been quite measured in how we look at what the factors are that are creating risk. But look, Ray Dalio is going out there saying we, can, we have a civil war. I don't see him as, you know, a, someone who bases his opinions yeah, no. <laughs> based on <laughs> just, you know, his latest fancy. I mean, there is real analysis that, that suggests that could happen. So whether you think that's a 5% risk or a 40% risk, I mean, in either case, it would be well worth doing some things now to prevent it. All right. On on that note, 
we are going to conclude the podcast. But I really want to thank you, Danielle, for spending this time with us and for the work that you've been doing. You know, it's amazing that you took that skill set that you had, that you got at Harvard as an MBA and you got at Cornell, and ultimately translated into something that addresses these issues. So thank you for being a leader in this area, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation and uh, look forward to all of us working towards better democracy in the years ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I tell you, uh, you really hammered home to me why it was important. And I wrote it down. Every executive of every major company should care about democracy. You really hammered that home because I didn't think about the, the effect of those kinds of activities and that risk you know, it has on the commercial enterprise. So you opened my eyes. So I appreciate well, thank it. Thank you, David. One person at a time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thank you for listening to Decrypted Unscripted, a podcast by David Bitterman and Dominique Shelton Leipzig. If you're enjoying the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. To learn about the podcast, you can also go to our website 